Good evening, everybody. My name is Stephen Dunbar-Johnson. I had to just check that. Um, I'm President International of the New York Times, and as such, it's my very great honor to welcome you all here this evening. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, thank you for making the time to come to this event. Uh, this is actually, despite the fact that we started uh, the New York Times Climate Hub uh, this morning, this is our official opening. Um, and we are here amongst the Conference of the Trees, Ez Devlin's magical and magnificent installation. We, yes, applause, applause. <laughs> Ez is here somewhere, she will be speaking later and explain um, some of the magic of, this, of, the, of these trees. We have over 70 sessions programmed over 90 day, nine days. Uh, so this is actually 90, it feels like 90 days, but this is over nine days, 70 sessions. This is the largest event the New York Times has ever put on outside of the, uh, outside of the United States. Um, and I have to say, uh, when we embarked on this, um, it, was, it, was a, it was a long time ago, but I really must thank, uh, with great sincerity, Morgan Stanley and Siemens Energy for, for their support um, as our principal sponsors. Also, our supporting sponsors, um, Leaps by Bayer, uh, IKEA, and Google. Without them, we wouldn't be here, so thank you very much. So as I mentioned, it's been a very long road to get us here with the, the manifold of issues and uncertainties that COVID has caused. It's also the culmination of a great deal of work and I'm deeply appreciative of the team. My international band of mostly sisters um, and the occasional brother that has put in so much effort to get us here. That we chose this moment, COP26, to show up in such a significant way is a reflection of the importance of this moment and of this time. Our job at the New York Times is to inform, to research, to gather diverse perspectives, to hold government to account and businesses to account, all in the aim of providing our readers with the information they need to make informed decisions. So over the course of nine days, we are inviting com the community here in Scotland, policymakers, negotiators, students, critically students and young people, business leaders, innovators, scientists, and young climate leaders to take part in events featuring some 20 journalists and more than 250 speakers. We want everyone who visits to have access to bright climate minds as we look at and debate the concrete policy frameworks needed to achieve net zero by 2050. And the business, technological, financial, and social acumen that are required to do so. So right here, amongst the trees, we will host a series of debates. In fact, we've already started, as many of you have seen, and talks. Next door in the forum, we are inviting audiences to hear from some of the world's leading climate innovators, scientists, and business leaders. We will be hosting workshops, documentary film screenings, a climate education day, and much more. We want to encourage serendipitous encounters with scientists, business leaders, investors, even some of our journalists, that's a, ch that's a challenge, um, with COP delegates and for young voices to be heard, all in this expansive space that has become the New York Times Climate Hub for the next nine days. Joining us too will be audiences worldwide as we stream our editorial events live into the schools and homes of the many, many Times readers who care deeply about climate change and our coverage of these issues. So the ambition of this kaleidoscopic program is underpinned by our mission, which is to help people seek the truth 
and understand the world. We, de we do this through deeply reported independent journalism in our news reports, and we, ho we hold our live, li our live journalism, events like this, to the same high standards. To be clear, ours is not a position of advocacy or activism. It is one of infor informing and seeking the truth. The New York Times was one of the first to establish a de dedicated climate desk in 2017 and has been a global force for helping people understand the real world impacts of the warming planet. Our reporters take readers to communities where coastal populations are already fighting rising sea levels, to the remote communities living in unhabitable conditions as temperatures rise. They draw from a palette of visual tools and technology to help readers grasp the complex and intangible climate science from interactive visualizations to explain the world's most polluted cities and multimedia explorations to tell the story of how carbon mineralization could be harnessed to help find, fight climate change. In the past year, our climate desk, led by Hannah Fairfield, published more stories focused on climate change than any other newspaper in the United States or in Europe. And it's an effort spanning over 30 plus bureaus and newsrooms worldwide as our reporting teams work together to explain the significance of climate change and translate the policies, politicking, and climate science for our growing international audience. Those international audiences engaged in our journalism continue to grow, and I'm very proud to say Today, this very day, in our, our third quarter earnings report, we announced that we have surpassed the milestone of one million international digital news subscribers outside of the United States. That's an important milestone for us because it's subscribers that support our journalism. Um, it supports the journalism of people like Hannah and her team Focus on climate change and our 1,700 strong newsroom of women and men. They provide the, the, the resources that help us conduct this work. To that end, before we invite First Minister Nicola Sturgeon to have a conversation with our UK Bureau Chief Mark Landler, I would like to invite Hannah just to say a few words about the Climate Desk and the work that they do. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you for that introduction, Stephen. I am so happy to be here with you all in this incredible space, and so happy to be covering COP26 with a tremendous group of reporters and editors and photographers. I have been so lucky to be the climate editor of the New York Times for nearly five years, and the size and the scope of our desk has grown over that time. And the way that we tell the most urgent stories of our time has changed too. Our climate coverage constantly redefines what storytelling can be and, and what it looks like. We are using drones to take us places we cannot otherwise go, like Greenland's ice sheet, which is so riddled with holes in some places that scientists say it is starting to look like Swiss cheese. We use cinemagraphic video so readers can see waves crash over the edges of Scotland's own Orkney Islands threatening to erase coastal archaeological sites that are 5,000 years old. Satellite imagery allows us to show new risks to some of the world's major cities, like Chicago, which is at the mercy of a great lake swinging between record high levels and record low ones. And we've worked with local photographers around the globe to document the dangers of extreme heat on people who live in places like Guatemala and Nigeria, Greece and India, and many countries on the front lines of climate damage right now, those local photographers take you inside their own communities to see the intimacy and the fear of what people are experiencing. 
We've built augmented reality to show you what it is like to breathe the air in the world's most polluted cities. And just last month, we took you inside a model of a 15,000 meter tall thundercloud created by the biggest wildfire that California had this year. We've also created data visualization to show you how much hotter your own hometown is now than when you were born and how much hotter it is going to become over your own lifetime. We've revealed the invisible by using infrared photography to capture imagery of methane leaks that we made visible, pouring out of oil and gas, drilling and storage sites across Texas. In each of these stories, which have been told by the phenomenal reporters who travel to all of these places, has one essential job, to help our readers understand the world around us. So thank you for being those readers. I would now like to welcome Mark Landler, the London Bureau Chief of the New York Times, and First Minister Nicholas Sturgeon to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and First Minister, thank you for helping uh, us kick off these uh, two weeks of panels and discussions at the Climate Hub. But more importantly, thank you for uh, throwing open the doors to Glasgow, uh, a city that you've called home for 30 years uh, as the site of this crucially important meeting. I'd always been told that Glasgow was a cool city, um, somewhat in the, in the shadow of Edinburgh. Uh, but now that I've actually spent a couple of days here, I, I can see where the rep comes from, and I think there, there will be more than a few new fans of, yeah. of Glasgow. C cool and usually cold, but very warm yes. people. Yes. Um, you've pointed out uh, that few cities better encompass the transition from an industrial fossil fuel world to a carbon neutral world uh, than Glasgow, mm -hmm. and I'd, I'd welcome hearing a few words from you on that theme. But I do also want to drill down, if you'll pardon the choice of verb, into Scotland's contribution to the net zero goals of this uh, conference, because I think they're noteworthy. Um, you gave a speech last week about this, uh, in which you said, among other things, um, that the UK Committee on Climate Change confirmed that we have decarbonized more quickly than any G20 nation. We've already halved our emissions since 1990. We're committed to a 75% reduction by 2030, and we aim to reach net zero by 2045 at the latest. Our targets are not just amongst the most ambitious anywhere in the, anywhere in the world, they're also amongst the toughest. So how's it going? Okay, well firstly, let me tell you why Glasgow is the perfect location. That's a really unbiased opinion, uh, incidentally, for this COP26 summit. Glasgow, in many ways was the birthplace of the industrial revolution. You know, we helped power the world into the industrial age. Uh, the summit is taking place on the banks of the River Clyde. A hundred years or so ago, if you'd looked up and down the River Clyde, you would have seen, you know, round about a fifth of all of the shipping tonnage in the world being built. So that's Glasgow's history. To fast forward to today and potentially, and I use that word deliberately because there's a, a long way to go in this COP26 summit to see what the outcome is, but potentially people 100 years from now will look back on this summit, I hope, and describe Glasgow as the place that the world really took the, the correct path in this fork in the road uh, for our planet. So Glasgow is a really, really apt location. In terms of the Scottish experience and the credibility I think we bring to this. We have decarbonized faster than any G20 country. Uh, over the past few years, we, and I'd describe it as uh, being, we have come halfway to net zero. We have cut emissions already by 
51.5% on the last, uh, the last count. Now, let me inject a note of humility into that because we had hoped by this point to have reduced emissions by 55%. So we haven't quite met the target we had set. Um, and therefore, we need to, to catch up with that and, and power forward. 97% of all of the electricity we use in Scotland already comes from renewable sources. So I, I think we can credibly say that we are leading by example. That said, for Scotland, as for so many other countries, the next half of the journey is going to be much tougher. Uh, our targets are not just aligned with the Paris Agreement goals, they exceed the Paris Agreement goals, 75% reduction by 2030, which is not a long time away, and aiming to become net zero by 2045. Now, we say that as if it is going to be really easy. It's not going to be easy. That involves, for Scotland, completely decarbonising how we heat our homes and public buildings. It involves significant decarbonisation of our transport system, uh, roads, railways, aviation ferries, which are uh, obviously a big uh, mode of transport in parts of Scotland. So massive challenges ahead, but I think we can take heart from the progress we've made so far. You know, First Minister, you, you alluded to the, to the question I was going to ask you, um, which has to do with the 75% target. Um, Chris Stark, the Chief Executive mm. of the Committee on Climate Change, told the BBC Scotland last, year, uh, last week that he thinks the Scottish Government may have, quote, overcooked its emission reductions targets, specifically the 20, the 75% mm. number. Um, does he have a fair criticism? Uh, look, it's a very, very ambitious target, and it was debated in Parliament quite uh, extensively because our targets are statutory. Uh, we also have to report on them on an annual basis. That's what one of the things, unlike other countries, they also include emissions from aviation and shipping. So that's what I mean by saying they're not just ambitious, they're also amongst the toughest targets in the world. So yes, it is a really, really stretching target. Chris um, is, is hugely uh, expert and, and credible. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure he won't mind me saying this. He used to work in the Scottish Government. He's somebody I know uh, reasonably well. We listen carefully to him and to the Committee on Climate Change. But, and this is the but here, in a context which you could describe uh, as being the context of COP26, of too much under-ambition on the part of governments around the world, if I'm going to be criticised on the climate challenge, I'd probably rather be criticised on being over-ambitious than under-ambitious, because even if, and I want to be very clear, our determination is to meet that 75% target by 2030, but say we only get to 70 or 72 or 73, that's probably further than we would have got had we only set a target of 60% reduction because if we'd set the target of 60 or 65, that's what we would have aimed for and we might have hit that. So I think the whole world needs to challenge itself to get to where we need to be much quicker and to go, to go much further. So yeah, it's going to be tough, but we'll have a, a really, uh, we'll do everything we can to meet it. And, and let's not forget the science here. The science is telling us we are running out of time and the planet is in serious trouble. And if we don't limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, then there are existential questions for parts of the world and for all of us, the impact is catastrophic. So against that backdrop, I think we've all got an obligation to try to raise our ambition as, as much as we possibly can. And the whole world has to probably half emissions by 2030 to stay on that 1.5 degrees trajectory. And rich developed countries who have done the most to contribute to climate change should be aiming higher than that so that the less developed countries that have done the least have a, a lower expectation on them. So I will defend our ambition and I will do my damnedest, pardon the French, over uh, the next uh, few years to make sure we hit those targets. You know, one of the things that's fascinated me uh One of the things that's fascinated me as a journalist uh, in the two years I've been based in London is seeing the places where Scotland and, and England or the U Scotland and the UK diverge. Uh, certainly your response at various stages of the pandemic uh, has been to take a somewhat different tack 
And uh, it's worth noting that when you take the subway in Glasgow, everyone wears a mask. When you take the tube in London, half the people don't. Um, and I think that reflects some of the emphasis you've put on the pandemic. And likewise, with these emissions targets, they're more ambitious than the UK targets. Um, uh, in some cases, strikingly so. What I'm wondering is, what is it about the, Scot the Scottish economy, the Scottish uh, population, and the political culture that makes you feel that you can push it further? Is it just a question of scale? This is a country of a few million people, not a country of 60 million? What, what's the difference? I'll come on to the question directly in the context of the climate change targets in a moment, yeah. and, and the Committee on Climate Change actually is relevant to my answer there too, but just let me be very clear. I, I don't do things differently from the UK government just for the sake of doing things differently. Right. Uh, you know, if you take face coverings, I, my judgment as, as First Minister and being responsible for, for these decisions is that that's a, a sensible thing to do while we're still in the, the grip of the pandemic. So we, we, we make these judgments based on what we think is right. And ultimately, I am accountable to the Scottish people for those decisions. If I get them right or if I get them wrong, I, I was just uh, reflecting to you earlier on, the last time I was in this space, it looked very different, but it was uh, a leader's debate in the Scottish election just a few months ago, which, of course, you know, I, I won fairly convincingly. So that's the accountability that I uh, have. On uh, the committee on, uh, on the climate change targets, the Committee on Climate Change, in terms of our 2045 net zero target, they said we should uh, have a target ahead of the rest of the UK's 2051. And the reasons for that were, firstly, our greater capacity uh, on carbon sinks, so, you know, our land mass. So we, we've got about 10% of the UK population. Last year, we planted 80% of all the trees that were planted in the UK because our land mass lends itself more to that. Uh, we've got a big program just now of peatland restoration. So there are, there are more ways in which we can absorb carbon. So that's one of the reasons. And also, and this is slightly more controversial because of recent decisions that the UK government has taken, the, the North Sea infrastructure ideally positions us to really maximise the potential of carbon capture um, and storage, for example. Um, now, the recent decision of the UK government not to prioritise the Scottish cluster of that is, is a bit of a, a setback and hopefully we can persuade them to, to think again. So there are, are different characteristics. Now, what we need to do better in Scotland, uh, to be candid, I talked earlier on about the massive progress we've made so far, you know, the electricity from renewables, for example, we've, you know, wind uh, power, for example, doing really well. What we've not done well enough, and we need to get better at, not least to support the just transition away from oil and gas, is capture more of the economic benefit of renewable technology. So a lot of the wind projects in Scotland are foreign uh, investments into Scotland. Great, we welcome them, but we haven't yet captured enough of that benefit in our own jobs and supply chain. So we're doing many things well, but I'm a great believer in being candid around the things that we have to do much better on too. Well, you actually singled out two or three strands I wanted to sort of pursue with you in, in that answer. Um, one on the carbon sinks issue. Um, and your reference to peatland restoration. The, the climate action tracker that, that is an independent scientist survey of climate policies generally ranks the United Kingdom quite high in a number of categories in terms of its ambition for reduction targets. One area that's a weak spot is um, that area of carbon capture, carbon sinks, working with farmers, working with the agricultural sector. Um, they rank the, the UK as insufficient in that area. Clearly, as you say, most of the, much of the action in that sphere is gonna be up in Scotland. Why has that lagged? Or if you, if you don't think it's lagged, why do you think they're wrong in, in viewing it that way? I, I, I wouldn't sit here and say they're wrong. I've not seen, or mm -hmm. I, I'm not familiar with all the detail of what you've just, I'd be very interested to look mm -hmm. at it. I, I'm not going to argue that they're wrong. I think we, we have to do better in all of these things. I, I suspect on aspects of it, Scotland might be doing better than tree planting, for example, yeah. not because we're inherently better at planting trees because our land mass is, is different. Agriculture is a big challenge for us. The big agriculture sector, really important part of our economy, also a, a part of our economy that emits a lot uh, and therefore we need to 
reduce emissions there. My uh, agriculture minister just uh, earlier this week, uh, I think, was announcing work we are doing with the farming sector to test different ways of reducing emissions in agriculture. Yeah, I was speaking at uh, an event organised by the uh, Hutton Institute in Scotland last night. They're doing a lot of very innovative work around vertical farming, for example. So there's lots going on there. But all of this is work we really need to accelerate. I, I come back to the point I made earlier on, we're running out of time on this. So whether it's on reducing emissions, absorbing uh, carbon, uh, doing all of the things we know, need, uh, know we need to do around land use, uh, biodiversity, we really have to crack on and do much more and do it faster. You mentioned earlier the UK's dis uh, government's decision on this carbon capture storage mm -hmm. initiative. Um, I wonder whether, for the audience, you could explain a bit what this project uh, is and, and, and maybe express why you were disappointed with the decision not to go ahead. Well, it's probably the, the most developed carbon capture um, project in the UK. There's a number across the UK. The UK government was deciding which ones to give what they call track one priority funding for. And it's, it's effectively in the northeast of Scotland. Well, there's a cluster of projects. The ACORN project is at the heart of it. And it's about using the existing infrastructure, the, the pipelines, the uh, infrastructure of the North Sea to uh, store uh, carbon, capture and store carbon. Now, there are some people, not just in Scotland, across the world who think, who are suspicious about carbon capture and storage because they, they, they worry that it is just an excuse to keep exploiting fossil fuels and keep you know, sort of churning out carbon emissions. And we've got to get that balance right, but it is a really important way of dealing with some of the carbon that is not easy to, to simply stop producing. And the Committee on Climate Change recognised that without carbon capture and storage, our journey to net zero will be much, much harder to achieve. So I, I hope we can uh, persuade the UK government to up the level of priority for that. I, I think we should be looking at doing more of this, not less. So it's not about crowding out other projects. It's just saying, let's get behind as many of the viable ones as we possibly can. Right. You mentioned earlier the North Sea infrastructure. Um, and uh, so I have to raise an issue. You know, you've been asked about uh, a lot recently. Um, a, a few months ago, you said it was time for the UK's Oil and Gas Authority to reassess a decision to open the new Campbell oil field off Shetland. Um, but you've stopped short, and correct me mm. if I'm wrong, uh, of opposing this outright. Um, Cambo, in a way, symbolizes the tensions between the imperative of reducing emissions and the need to create jobs or maintain well-paying jobs. Um, a few people have said you've sort of been sitting on the fence. Can I? Yeah. Can I invite you to climb off the fence tonight I, I and declare more of a position on this? <laughs> I don't think I am on, on the okay. fence. What I'm trying to do, and I know it, it can be frustrating, is recognise the position I'm in, the complexities of the situation, and actually uh, chart a way forward to what I think is the outcome we need. Um, so that, uh, yeah, that can be characterised as sitting on the fence, but you know, sometimes getting to an outcome is is the important thing. So what, what, what I've said is I don't think Campbell should just get the green light to go ahead. I think the, at the vet, Campbell got a license, I think, about 20 years ago. That can't legally, I, I suspect, be simply magic to weigh. There is now uh, a process of development permission. But unlike new licenses, it doesn't have to go through any kind of climate assessment. I think it absolutely should, as a minimum it can't just be given the green light. But what I'm trying to grapple with is the current reality and how we move away from the current reality to where we want to be as quickly as possible. Our current reality is that we are dependent on oil and gas for part of our energy needs. Um, and we need to make sure that as we move away from oil and gas, we are moving to renewable and low carbon alternatives and that we're not simply uh, replacing domestic production with imported production. That would be counterproductive from the point of view of the environment and as part of that that we're creating new job opportunities for the people 100,000 people in a total in Scotland whose jobs depend on oil and gas but we need to accelerate that transition and I do think it is at the very least highly questionable if accelerating and being serious about accelerating that transition away from fossil fuels is consistent with opening up new oil fields um, and 
But how do we make that transition as fast as possible? For, for people like me, and it's not my decision whether Campbell gets the go-ahead or not, but trying to persuade those whose decision it is to take the decision responsibly, I've got to get beyond simply one line, I oppose it or I support it, and actually chart the way that allows us to get to the point where we as a country are moving much faster away from oil and gas because we have created the alternatives. You know, I remember uh, in a presidential election a few years ago in the US, uh, Hillary Clinton got into a lot of trouble for talking about the, the end of the coal industry. Um, for you, so I understand the dilemma. It's, the, it's the, in a way an ultimate dilemma for a politician. I want us to stop being reliant on fossil fuels. I don't have don't any difficult, and, and to, be, to give credit to the oil and gas industry here, they are, are recognizing that they need to make that transition. I, I have no doubt about the end point I want to reach, but mm. I want to get, I want to make that transition and get there without, I, I grew up in, not far, in Ayrshire, not far from Glasgow in the 1970s and 80s when the, the scarring effect of deindustrialization was being acutely felt because the Thatcher government at the time, you know, frankly didn't pay any attention to what happened to the jobs of people who were dependent on the industries that were being wound down. We can't make that mistake again. So I want to get to the end point uh, and whatever difficulties Hillary had back then, I, I have no difficulty in saying that, but I want to get to the end point without leaving people and communities on the scrap heap along the way. It wouldn't be a session with the First Minister if um, the subject of independence didn't find its way into the conversation, so I'm, uh, I'm just going to go... Just no, see, I didn't raise it. <laughs> no, to be fair, I, th I thought I would just save, the, <laughs> save you the time. Um, obviously, you've campaigned on this issue for, for, for your, your, really your entire career, and, and one of the criticisms, and I, and I will bring this around to climate, but one of the criticisms that anti-independence or, or pro-union uh, people have long made is that an independent Scotland would lack the economic and financial muscle that it has by being part of the United Kingdom and that would disadvantage it in the global economy. He, here's my question, not to answer that per se, but, but specifically as it applies to climate. How would an independent Scotland manage this transition. Now, obviously, this won't happen for a while. You'd be further along in the transition. Um, would you be able to marshal the massive climate finance investments you need as a much smaller independent economy than you could as part of the United Kingdom? Um, yeah. I mean, we're managing this transition largely anyway because of the, the devolved responsibilities that my government has. So, yeah, we don't have all of the, the levers and the powers and the responsibilities that we would have as an independent country, but much of this we're managing already. We were talking about climate finance. We, this has been the climate, uh, the finance day of, of COP26. We've recently taken a, you know, a green investment portfolio uh, out to the market to billion pounds worth of uh, green projects, trying to attract uh, private finance from all over the world uh, here to Scotland. Um, and we have massive, massive assets and massive advantages in doing that. Scotland's one of the richest countries in the world. You know, we've not only had over the past 40 years the oil and gas uh, assets, which we, we want to move away from as, as quickly as we can, but you know, we've got some of the world's best assets in terms of, of wind and, and wave and, and tidal power. You know, our food and drink industry, one of the, the best in, in the world, real strengths in life sciences and in, in technology and in, in digital at services, we, we've got so much going for us as a country. And the idea that, you know, if I look around the world right now and, you know, what, 200 or so independent countries of, of all sizes and shapes and, and different uh, economic attributes and, and challenges, my goodness, if, if Scotland, you know, doesn't have what it takes to be a successful, prosperous, independent country, then I don't know, you know, where on, on the planet uh, does. And, and this argument that we can't, Scotland, because we're not independent, has just been ripped out of the biggest single market in the world against our will. And we're seeing the impacts of that uh, increase almost every day right now. And those who say, well, Scotland's got a deficit. Yes, we've got a fiscal deficit. Many countries in the developed world do, but all of these arguments that people use against independence, they are the reality that we face right now because we're not independent. So put the, the powers and the levers in our own hands. No country is guaranteed success. No country is owed a living. But the ingenuity, the 
the skills, the talents, and the massive natural assets of Scotland, we would be a successful, vibrant, prosperous, independent country. And I hope we'd be back in the European Union as well with the family of nations right across the continent. Can I put the question to you in just in a slightly different way then? Is there, are there things you could do in the climate transition faster, better, by being independent than you can now well, by being part of the UK? Well, we've been talking about one, the, the carbon capture. Okay. You know, for example, we would, if we were independent, it wouldn't make these uh, issues simpler. I'm not suggesting they would, but they would put them into our hands. I wouldn't have to be working out how to try to get onto the same page with Boris Johnson over North Sea licensing. These would be decisions that, that lay with us. So yes, there would be things we could do differently, faster, and we'd be accountable for those decisions. That said, climate change is a global issue. So countries, and that's what has been demonstrated in, in Glasgow over the course of this summit, countries have to come together and work together and collaborate. And an independent Scotland is not about you know, sort of closing ourselves off and doing everything ourselves for the sake of it. Actually, the argument for independence, particularly in the post-Brexit environment, is fundamentally and essentially an internationalist argument. It's about how can Scotland best contribute to, yes, prosperity and more equality at home, but best contribute whatever we can bring to bear on building a better, greener, fairer world. It is entirely outward-looking and internationalist. We, we are at the end of our, uh, of our allotted time, but before I let the First Minister leave, I just do want to ask you, since um, many of us will be spending the next week and a half uh, in your town, uh, what are the one or two things we ought to do before we leave that are outside the scope of this uh, Well, I, I, I am the member of the Scottish Parliament for Glasgow South Side, so the first thing I would say is go across the river to the south uh, of, of the city. Uh, you'll find there wonderful uh, restaurants, cafes, uh, the tramway theatre, uh, the tramway uh, theatre, for example. Um, but, you know, anything in Glasgow, you know, go to see the Borough Collection, Kelvin Grove, where the world leaders gathered for... Um, a bit of a, a get together on Monday night. This is, you know, I, I'm going to just say it because it's kind of the unspoken thing over the course of our conversation. You are currently in the greatest city in the world. Um, <laughs> and so don't. <laughs> I'm going to make yeah. a small pitch for New Obviously, York. Obviously, Edinburgh, Dundee, <laughs> Aberdeen, uh, and Perth, etc., are all great cities too. Uh, but I'm allowed to show a bit of favouritism during COP. Look, you know. Seriously, um, Glasgow is a great city, and uh, those of you who are visiting here for COP, you know, make sure you enjoy. The one thing you will always find in Glasgow is a warm welcome from the people. These are definitely the, the friendliest people you'll find, I think, anywhere in the world. First Minister, thank you very thank much you. for your time. I want to see a world where sustainability isn't the exception, but it's the norm. It is costing our planet its vitality, its strength, and that it's why we have to help and heal our one and only earth. More action, less words. I demand the world leaders to speak up for climate action. I'd like to live in a world where people actually take action. We only have one Earth, so let's stop destroying it. I want to grow up in a world without climate change. Understand the importance of nature, as nature has helped us all. It provides us everything that we need, like fruits, vegetable, oxygen. So please be supportive. I want to see a world where humans learn to coexist with nature and respect it. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rebecca Blumenstein with the New York Times, and I can't tell you how excited I am about this session. 
There are many, many ways to tell the climate story, and I'm so honored to be sharing this stage with two artists who are really on the cutting edge of harnessing art, design, creativity, and music to tell the climate story in, in incredibly powerful ways. And um, Estev Lin is with us here and is obviously the architect of this incredible space. Uh, Beatty Wolf. <laughs> B.D. Wolf is a musician who's done some incredible data visualization that, I'm not kidding you, encompasses 800,000 years. We're going to be seeing it at the end of this session, but lest any of you think you want to escape early, B.D. is going to actually play and perform at the end of this session. So, so I'm, I'm really excited for, for this conversation. Um, S, could you just give us a sense of, I know that you did a similar uh, uh, installation of trees at the Somerset House when you were actually told, well, well, that's against the rules. We would never allow trees in the Somerset House. Could you, could you talk about how you are, are thinking about, about um, storytelling in a, in a space like this? Well, firstly, thank you, everyone, for just being in those seats. They're all upcycled school chairs, as you can see. <laughs> um, it's, I've been working on this environment for the last year, and it gives me real pleasure to see all the people coming through today and all the speakers. Um, it was super humbling to see the, the speakers who've been on this stage. Um, but the idea really um, was inspired by Richard Power's extraordinary novel, The Overstory, which many of you may have read. He won the Pulitzer Prize for it, and what he did 700 pages of three-generational saga, American novel, but the protagonists are not human. They are trees. So as a human reader, you have to tune in to the time scale and the pace of a non-human species, and we're just not used to doing that. And the way the book is structured is so clever, because it's quite hard. The first few chapters, you, I have to say I struggled, because I'm not used to tuning in to uh, that type of pace, but by the third chapter, it starts to reward you for having paid attention to a species that isn't yours. Um, so that was really the first uh, thought, 197 trees or plants combination um, as a conference of the trees in parallel to the conference of the parties, and honestly thinking, what quality of conversation might we have in this space if we thought that a species that wasn't ours was also the protagonist of this conference. Uh, and if we thought that they were actually bearing witness to what we decide and what we discuss in this room. On another level, um, I'm no expert in this, but I've done a ton of reading. And if you smell the air in here, it is full of something called phytoncides. It's my new favorite word that I've just looked up. Um, but they are the essential oils that the trees give off. And they reduce cortisol levels. That's why we feel calmer when we walk amongst the trees. It's all very much science-based and proven. They help us resist infection and help us fight cancer. They make us sleep better. So I'm hoping this would be a more conducive environment for the type of conversations we want to have here. And as you very deliberately put, put humans, really, as, as the smaller entity in this dynamic, right? The trees are the ones who are having the conference, not us. Exactly. And, and, and in a sense, have you, have you come to this moment as a climate activist, would you say? Or is there, is there a moment when you just realized, I mean, you, you, you design visuals and art, you work with Beyonce, uh, a number of celebrities, and then you've taken a turn to climate. Has this been a sudden conversion? There, there was a wonderful moment when Al Gore was on this stage earlier, and he said, there's such a thing as an anti-activist. Um, and I'm afraid, I think, um, that, you know, the, the phrase designer um, describes all of us. Uh, when we go shopping and we fill our supermarket trolley, we are designers of those choices. Um, and they are either activists or anti-activists at this point, I think. Um, I don't know if you'd agree with that, BT, but I, so they're I'm not, not being sure, I'm not sure we sense. have much of a choice right now. I think the urgency of the situation is, are you anti-activist or are you activist? And, and I, I don't know, what do you think? No, I, I totally agree. Um, I think we've reached a point in time where it's sort of beyond any questionable doubt what is happening now as we speak. So, you know, from my perspective, um, 
you know, with the data visualization project that you mentioned, I had my epiphany when I was a teenager and I went to see An Inconvenient Truth and left the cinema completely aghast, like I was just so furious that we would got to where we would got to. And I wrote a song called From Green to Red after that experience and then thought, well, I won't record this song because everyone will see the film and it will be on a totally different path within five years or 10 years. Um, obviously, that didn't happen. And a couple of years ago, I was talking about my work at JPL, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratories. As one does. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, my work ends up going into unusual spaces. So um, I'd just done a space broadcast using the horn antenna that proved the Big Bang with the Nobel laureate who won the prize for discovering cosmic microwave radiation. So that was also in part why I was there. And at the end of the talk, one of the chief engineers for NASA came up and showed me these atmospheric CO2 graphs. And I had that same moment of just what the hell, we're here, you know, and this is almost 15 years later. And so getting a sense of how intangible that data is, how cold it is for a lot of people, how people just can't really absorb it, um, I thought, well, how can you turn it into something that is humanized and relatable and where anyone from a kid to a grandparent, it doesn't matter if they're into science or not or whatever or aware of the climate issues, they can see something and they can get a sense of where we are on this planet right now at this point in time. And so, yeah, taking the 800,000 years of um, climate data, I created a woven, dynamic, interactive timeline of our planet, looking at human impact and obviously rising CO2 levels um, that people could then move their hands over the fabric and pull out the specific carbon PPM and the planetary timeline date. And that was all set to the song that I wrote in 2006, From Green to Red, which is depicted in this visualization as we go from green to red. So, And your original song in 2006, you meant to invoke a, a, a traffic light, right? We're in the green zone and we're getting to the red. And now this has just taken on the texture of all of this data. Absolutely, yeah. How did you possibly do all of that data? Did you have a team? Did you like logistically, uh, you know, for both of you, I guess, like how, you have the idea, how do, you, how do you execute as artists? Well, for me, every time it's totally different because every project is totally different. And the through line, the narrative, the intention, the why is paramount. And then whatever is helping to realize that, a collaborator or a layer or a setting or a aspect of technology, those are all you know, sort of ways of telling that story. Um, with this, it was actually pretty simple comparatively to some of the other projects. It was really just about taking what is essentially a, a graph. I mean, it's NOAA, NASA, you know, data that is available. Anyone can access it. So it's not particularly high and mighty. It's just taking something that we can all access and turning it into something that we can really see and feel and absorb. Um, and so using a game engine to essentially create a, a live, dynamic retelling of that data so that every time it plays, it's slightly different. The, the woven texture is slightly different. And we will, see the, we will see the video of this at the end of the session, and it's going to be on display here in Glasgow as well this week. Yeah, tomorrow it will be projected onto the Armadillo building for Energy Day. So, S, tell me about execution. Um, this was a big, bold uh, ambition. I have a very simple question. Where did you find the trees? I'm oh glad we're going to be replanting them, but like, where did this come from? Yeah, I mean, the trees that are in this room are all native species. They're all local species, and they are all designed, chosen, so that they're going to survive their nine days here. Then they're all going to be replanted just over there um, outside this building as a sort of legacy of this um, New York Times climate hub. Um, Stephen Dunbar Johnson has been really passionate um, about every detail of this. In fact, the way the room is heated um, is all uh, of reused uh, vegetable oil. I think he's been really careful about every single aspect of this, which is why it's probably a bit cold. So <laughs> thanks for that. But um, yeah, 
Uh, Philip Jaffers, the landscape gardener, he's done all of the you know, really careful precision uh, nutrition of the trees and everything. So by the time they get to be replanted, and I guess they're having a rehearsal. They're just coming here to you know, have their moment and then move on outside. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I, I want to be clear that you know, we know that putting trees inside of a room in and of itself uh, is not a statement. It's really how they're going to live beyond as well. And, but you've hit obstacles along the way. When the first installation of this was at Somerset House, you literally were told, we don't bring trees into Somerset House, correct? Yeah, I mean, that was, um, Somerset House is a very beautiful palace, really, it used to be uh, in London. And it was built on these enlightenment principles of sort of nature was over there and human geometry and control was over here. So written into the covenant of that piece of architecture was a stipulation that this very beautiful geometric courtyard must never, ever have any trees ever put into it. In fairness to William Chambers, who um, was the architect, he had designed uh, you know, Kew Gardens. So it's not like he was anti-tree. He just thought that nature should be over there in Kew Gardens, and you know, never shall the twain be intertwined. So it was when I was being shown around the building um, that uh, when the director said, you can do anything in this courtyard except put trees there, um, that of course, trees had to be put there. Yeah. <laughs> so BD, you did this incredible work of the 800,000 years, and, and then you were all set to, to, to launch this, and the pandemic happened. Uh, can you talk about how that kind of ended up, in a, in a strange way, working out, because, because it was first shown at the Nobel ceremony? Yeah, well, honestly, I, I, it sounds like a terrible thing to say, but when the pandemic hit, part of me was like, oh my God, thank God, because we're not going to be traveling, we're going to be working from home, we're going to be thinking differently about stuff that we've just been doing on autopilot. There's, there's a potential for a lot of awareness to be activated, um, which I think is actually the hardest thing. It's just so hard to activate awareness in people, but once they become aware, it's almost impossible to become unaware. So yeah, the, the From Green to Red project was going to be at all these festivals, and I was thinking, oh, <laughs> damn, because you know I didn't really want to be getting on any flights or having it travel. And then, yeah, lockdown hit, and the Nobel Prize Summit, which was the first and only Nobel Prize Summit, happened in April 2020, um, 2021, wow, this year. And I was asked to show the project and speak and, and perform after Al Gore and Sir David Attenborough. Um, so, you know, that was just obviously a wonderful honor, particularly because Al and, and the Inconvenient Truth had inspired everything. Um, but I think, I, I think something I've really realized is, and I realized this through, I have a philanthropic music dementia project looking at how music can help people with Alzheimer's and dementia. And essentially, music neurologically does miraculous things, you know? It's not just dementia, it's every neurological condition. And we still know so little about it. And from that research project that I did, um, very much inspired by the work of Oliver Sacks, who really founded a lot of what we know intuitively about music and art in science, he identifies there are two things that we need as human beings that are core to our humanity. And one of them is art, and the other is nature. Hmm. And I think those two things go hand in hand. You know, our greatest art is inspired by the natural world. The natural world is an intelligence, creativity beyond human imagination. It's also our greatest technology. Our technology exists over there. It's not in anything we can fabricate. And I think you know, that where human beings really could benefit is in a massive dose of humility and just realizing that you know, art and nature, you can't fast track these things. You know, technology did a wonderful job of fast tracking what it means to be a human being on this planet, but it shortchanged us in a lot of ways, and it didn't reflect the true cost in that fast tracking process, which is really a, a lot of why we are where we are. But art and nature can't be fast tracked, and they are so fundamental to us. And I, I think that, you know, wherever and whatever I can do to share that, you know, my, that's always been a sort of intention behind my work, but that's just become more resolute. So, so as we were talking backstage about uh, 
all of the alarming figures about climate change, about how, how you know, emissions keep rising, about how all, you know, there's, the, there's stories about the devastating impact of climate change increasingly, the global south, the global north. There's a lot of, 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 of preaching, sometimes preaching to the choir, but you both are using something different. You're using beauty to try to get a message across. Could you talk about just your, your, your thinking? Are you, are you deliberately trying for a more positive image or are you, are you trying to employ art uh, uh, to, to, to kind of stir people in a different way? I mean, I guess once we understand what the issues are, we ask ourselves, what are we doing? What are we making? First, we look at what we're doing. We say, well, what's the footprint? And I have been making touring music which has a terrible carbon footprint, and I've traveled a lot, which has a terrible carbon footprint. Um, and you look at that and you go, okay, what can I do? How can I address every aspect of that? Uh, and then I take guidance. I mean, actually, just being here the last three days, mainly what I've been doing is listening, just trying to listen, 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 and read. There's so much to be read. Um, and in my reading and in my listening, what I really came across was some advice to artists and designers and makers. And some of the most useful advice came from uh, a man called Timothy Morton, a wonderful eco-philosopher who I, I think is a colleague of Beatty's, who said the role of the artist is to not preach, but to amaze us into shifting our perspective and to amaze us into changing our behavior. And another very good colleague of mine said to me the other day, uh, the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. And actually, my mum, who is here, um, when I was a kid, I remember saying to her, what, what's the point of art, mum? And she said, well, you know that painting of the sunflowers that Van Gogh did? Um, once you've seen it, you won't look at sunflowers in the same way because you've seen how they looked through this person's particular gaze. And if we can do that, if we can bring our perspective so that, for example, the Jenny Holzer piece um, if not now, then when, projected up the chimney of the X power station that is the Tate Modern. Will we ever look at that chimney again without seeing, if not now, then when, projected up it? She's done us that service of allowing us a piece of perspective, which we won't forget now. Um, so I think that's been, been the mission, really. Another um, eco-philosopher who I really recommend you read, if you, if you can, a, a guy called David Abram. And he was actually a sleight of hand magician uh, before becoming an eco philosopher. And so I particularly am drawn to how he uses magic. Um, and it's just a story worth telling. Um, he was doing magic in a restaurant in Massachusetts, card tricks, coin tricks. And people started to complain to the manager of the restaurant because they thought he had spiked their food with some kind of hallucinogenic or something. Because when they left the restaurant, the sky looked bluer and the posters on the underground looked more vivid. And they complained, a number of people complained. And he said, listen, if I can destabilize your expectations of how cards and coins behave, then I destabilize your expectations about a lot of things, about how you feel you have to behave, about the choices you feel you have. And I do feel that arts, magic, illusion, these are all tools we can use to just help us realize we do have more choices than we think. It's really easy to think that you can't change. It's really easy for me to go, how do I not travel? How do I not get on a plane? How do I you know, manage my life in all the different ways I'm gonna have to manage my life? Um, and that's how we need to help. The wonderful Paul Hawken, uh, again, I'm sure many of you have read his books, but he said a thing that I find really encouraging. He said, climate change is not happening to us, but for us. Because all the things we've got to change to get through this crisis, we actually have to change anyway to make our society more just and more equitable and, and more joyful, actually. Um, and his wife said something to him. He sa she said, Paul, if in this next book you don't tell me what I need to do, I'm going to leave you. <laughs> and I think a lot of us feel like that. It's just, yeah, okay, but what do I need to do? You know, what should I do? And I think being able to break it down and say, well, in my immediate sphere of life, this is what I need to do. In my sphere of work and influence, this is what I can do. And then in my sphere of getting in touch with my elected representatives, this is what I can do and make it feel a bit less overwhelming. 
Does that resonate with you, BD, that you deliberately set out to, to use music to, to reach people in a more positive way? Yeah, I think that it's, it's storytelling. You know, we're all human beings and stories resonate with us and, you know, they, they remind us of why we're here. They remind us of our humanity. Art reminds us of our humanity. Nature reminds us of our humanity. And both of those things enrich our humanity. Um, and I think for me, it's like the power of art is to take stories that aren't being told, stories that are hidden in plain sight. You know, because I work with a lot of astrophysicists or neurologists or very different types of people that have so many wonderful things to share, so many magical things about this planet, but they might not have the specific way of telling that story. And so I just like to, I guess, be a bridge, you know, and bridge those other worlds so that it's music, it's art, it's design, it's technology, it's science, it's health. It's not one thing. It's a whole multi-layered experience that's also telling you something that, you know, yeah, excites and makes you feel magic and wonder and what Ez described. Um, I think that's the role of art, and I think art has to be a catalyst for social change. I don't think art can just be this vacuous, shallow, narcissistic experience, particularly now. It needs to be telling these stories that aren't being told in ways that people can relate to and in ways that really imprint. Because I think one of the issues with the digital, the digital revolution or the digital era that we're in is when we moved from physical to digital, we lost, I think, three things that are core to things going in deep and imprinting and staying with us. And those three things are tangibility, ceremony, and storytelling. And when you have those three things, you can have something go in in a way where it stays with you forever. You know, you remember opening up Abbey Road as a kid when you're seven, and it's this whole world of an experience. But that happened because you've got the tangible art form, you have a ceremony around it, and you have a story. And you know, now we have everything floating around, hitting us at this same superficial frequency. Nothing's being absorbed, nothing's going in, nothing's imprinting. And so actually, that's also what I feel. If you create experiences that have ceremony, have tangibility, have storytelling, a lot of the time, people walk away, and it's not just a oh, thinking about it for five minutes, they'll be thinking about it forever, you know, and that's the shift we need to make, is have things really stay with us. And I think what you're also talking about is what, what gives us meaning, you know, what gives us meaning, what gives us a sense of value, um, and it isn't, you know, buying another thing. You both have big followings, and I'd like you to talk about the role of popular culture. I'm hearing more about, you know, we're obviously here at COP26 and climate talks on these stage, stages with decision makers, but, but some people would argue that for there to be true change, climate change needs to turn up in sitcoms, in, 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 in music, in, in ways that, um, that surprise people. Um, we need it everywhere, everywhere. Every, anyone who's writing a sitcom out there, please weave this into the storyline, um, cartoons. I mean, it's urgent, every, every means possible. So, so do you, I mean, as you were talking about how it took 40 years, really, uh, uh, for, for society to, to largely ban cigarettes. Uh, this, is my, this is my quest. I often get a bit depressed about it all, and I try and find things that console me. And actually, Matty, who's from my studio, uh, and the rest of my studio team, we spent some time trying to console ourselves, trying to look for examples uh, of when has, our species ever made such a perspective shift uh, as we now have to in order to get through this and, and turn our whole culture around? Have we ever managed to do it? Can we do it? Are we capable? And in fact, this room was part of the tobacco industry. Um, and in uh, 1965, it was already clear that cigarettes were super bad for your health. The TV advertising was actually banned uh, from 1965. That, that campaign began. Um, it wasn't until the 1990s that the taxes started being overlaid. And then, of course, it wasn't until 2006 that smoking was banned in restaurants and bars. And I remember at the time, I don't know if you remember all of this, you know, all of the guys who run the pubs and the restaurants were saying, well, this will be a disaster. No one will come to our pubs anymore. No one will come to, you know, without smoking, a pub will be pointless. 
And look, here we are. We can't imagine smoking and eating at the same time. We can't, can't imagine that. We managed to make that shift. Uh, and there are other examples of that. Um, so it consoles me. One of, one of the pieces of work we made in the studio was um, called Memory Palace. And we just, in the studio, all sat down and tried to think of places, people, and rooms in which people had had ideas that led to a real change of perspective uh, that affected the whole species. And we came up with one for each millennia from 73,000 uh, years ago. Um, and it sort of, we need things like that, I think, to console us, to remind us that we can do it. But you're hoping it doesn't take 40 years. We haven't really got 40 years. Mm. So, so um, could you talk about, we're going to show uh, from green to red in, yeah. a, in a couple moments, but maybe you could close us out. Um, how, how much is, is popular culture on your mind as you're, as you're creating your, your work uh, to, to, to get through to people who may not be following every step of the negotiations of COP26? Oh, you know, I wish I could say, oh, it's so on my mind, but it, it, it's not in the sense of when I create the work, it, almost the ideas have to exist in a bit of a anechoic chamber. You know, I can't be thinking about how they might be perceived because it has to be very much true to the realization of what I think needs to come across. Um, I feel like there is a lot of hope. Um, I think even when you see the shifts, you know, as we've seen to plant-based burgers appearing in McDonald's and places like this. You know, I'm in California, and you can go into a McDonald's in Bakersfield, which you probably wouldn't want to, oh, and in and out in Bakersfield. Um, you know, and, and that's now the popular option. When you see those things, there is a tangible sense of a shift. Um, but I think, actually, you know, the point as made about the timelines, our timelines, our sense of timeline is so incredibly short-termist. And you know, the idea that with thinking maybe even 40 years ahead, I know that's because we don't know what those next 40 years will look like. But I think that's also why we got to the, where we've got to, because the sense of the long now, you know, really thinking for the next 100, 500, you know, 1,000 years, we've got so disconnected from that. And, so much is placed on the individual and what we realize now and today, and a lot of that is also technology and the narcissistic aspect of it, instead of what are we handing on for the future generations. And you know, you think of great structures or temples that those individuals wouldn't see the realization of that architecture. They'd have to know that it was gonna happen years after they pass away. And I think we really need a, a good sort of shift in our timeline, our sense of timeline. So I think that's also a good segue into the timeline of the planet that I'm going to be showing you now, um, Yeah, which is 800,000 years of atmospheric carbon CO2 data, which is not interactive here. It's just the sort of, um, you know, just the simple render version, but it was installed actually at the London Design Biennale, which as curated in London a few months ago, I think, right? Um, as an interactive version where you could move your hands over the fabric and pull out that data. It's, it's just remarkable. And if we could cue it up, please. Uh, I want to thank you both for some incredibly beautiful and inspiring words thank to you. end this day, our very first day.
don't want to hear that the problem is us so we live like we want in our own universe because man thinks he's god in a devilish way we're too proud to see what we won't even say we don't want to know don't want to know don't want to know don't want to know No, we don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know. So take my hand, babe, and I'll walk you to school, where you'll learn how to live by a new set of rules. Cause we played all our cards, but none left for you. Forgive us, my dear, can't you see? It's the truth that we don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know. No, we don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know. What happened to love? Is it? only defined by mankind but the creatures don't know for what cause they have died so we wipe off our hands on the fur and the hide we sit at the top with our great peace of mind we don't want to know don't want to know don't want to know don't want to know no we don't want to know don't want to know don't want to know don't want to know So remember, denial is a haunt of the head. Let your eyes and your heart guide your reason instead. When the hungry are starved, the full are still fed. We sit at the crossroads, the green turns to red. But we don't wanna know, don't wanna know, don't wanna know, don't wanna know. No, we don't wanna know, don't wanna know, don't wanna know. Hello. <laughs> okay. First in real life performance in 18 months. <laughs> yeah, or maybe more. Um, and what do I want to say about this? I want to say that, so I, I wrote this song a couple of years ago and um, just about another environmental song. Clearly that's all I'm thinking about. Um, and then COVID happened and it almost feels as if this was written since then. So, but this was written pre-pandemic. <laughs> So my heart, there's 
Cause the sickness in this world keeps on spreading through the land and sea. And though I know there's something in this world we must be learning, it's almost killing me. So hold your heart, my darling. Hold your heart, my darling. And hold your heart, my darling, now. So my heart, there's a hatred in this world keeps on growing. Through the lies we speak, and though I know the truth has never been so disturbing, it's almost killing me. So hold your heart, my darling. Hold your heart, my darling. Hold your my darling now As if the shadow falls forever I will rest with you And though there's nothing Sure about it, peace will take us through. A desperate heart, this ragged world needs your love more than ever. And there's no time to spend with every day. We're recording our demise like a legend. There's no more to share. So hold your heart, my darling. Hold your heart, my darling. And hold your heart, my darling. If the shadow falls forever, I will rest with you. And though there's nothing sure about it, peace will take us through. Oh, if the shadow falls forever, rest with you and though there's nothing sure about it peace will take us through Thank you very much. BT, thank you so much. Come all the way from Los Angeles to do that. Um, I'd like to thank everybody this evening. Um, Ez and BT, that was uh, a really inspiring session, so uh, deeply appreciated. Um, we're going to play you out. We're going to have a Scottish theme. It was actually started and led by Mark Landner's socks tonight. He has a Scottish theme, theme socks. But this is real Scotland. We have the Robert Gordon School who've come down from Aberdeen, some young student pipers, um, and I think they're going to march through. So please remain in your seats for a minute. They're going to march through to the front and then play us out. So once again, from all of us at the New York Times, thank you very much for what I believe has been a good first day, but it's the first. We've got a lot, lot of fabulous content to come. Um, so I'll see you tomorrow. But in the meantime, I welcome the, the pipers to come down. Thank you.